Thank you, Delay. So now we begin week 12 here. And so we've done our Vajrasattva purification. And so the 80th through the 82nd days of the retreat are the ones we're focused on here. And this one has to do with others as more important. Now remember we were looking at uh, three different sections of this particular uh, practice. So we started with um, equalizing others to ourselves and then exchanging self and others and so now others as even more important than ourselves. So here we contemplate on considering others as more important than ourselves and Rinpoche gives a quote here from Maitreya's ornament of the Mahayana Sutras which says, when a bodhisattva understands that others and himself are the same, so equalizing self and others, or consider others as dearer than him, he or she realizes that benefiting others is more important than benefiting him or herself. What is benefiting to himself or herself and what is benefiting to others? It is the same for being a bodhisattva. So as a bodhisattva, doing things to benefit ourselves is the same as benefiting others. Or doing something to benefit others is the same as doing something to benefit ourselves. We're all interdependent, interconnected, uh, and so forth. And then from uh, Shantideva, another quote, what need is there to say much more? The childish work for their own benefit, the Buddhas work for the benefit of others. Just look at the difference between them. Okay, so the very focus, and of course the path of altruism is what this is associated with, and so that's the idea of altruism, is doing something for others uh, regardless of whether or not we get anything out of it or not. We would do it anyway because it's the right thing to do, even if it, if it didn't cause us necessarily to feel good, for example. So we don't get anything in return, or even if we do, that is not the reason that we are doing it. So Rinpoche goes on then, therefore whoever has bodhicitta mind should hold others dearer than oneself all the time. And that can be a challenge for many of us. In fact, that can be pretty much a challenge for all of us from time to time. Uh, do you really want to hold that person as dearer than yourself? Um, so we have all kinds of things that come up where that can be a significant challenge for us. But even if it's a challenge, we can keep the principle in mind and the idea that that's what we're striving toward. He continues, for example, normally good parents, if they have a choice, would prefer saving their own child over saving their own lives. It is the same as bodhisattvas who understand all sentient beings are like their only child. And bodhisattvas generate even loving, greater loving compassion with bodhicitta toward sentient beings. Therefore, you should view others as more important than yourself. Good or bad, you should take others as more important than yourself generate more experiences from this practice. Read the great stories showing the benefits of this practice in the words of my perfect teacher, which starts on page 228 on that topic. There's a number of stories in there. It will strengthen your mind for this practice and make you happy. When you conclude, then do the concluding practice as before. And then he notes in the last paragraph there, we have now completed the meditation on precepts of arousing bodhicitta. First, considering others as equal to oneself. Second, exchanging oneself and others. And third, considering others more important than oneself. So we'll take a little break here. One of the things that we can look at as a part of this that was not covered in the commentary by Rinpoche is the moral development. Lawrence Kolbig did a lot of work on this and it's been uh, researched and so forth uh, since that. He was at Harvard. Uh, and that is in a real simple way that as we grow, we tend, in terms of moral development at least, we tend to move from a focus on yourself, me, 
to a broader focus of others. So it's we, a group of others, it can be the family, the tribe, the community, whatever. It gradually expands in most cases, not all. And then we go to a third level that not very many people get to, which is the focus on you, the other. And when we talk about altruistic intention, action, and so forth, that's what we're talking about, is getting to that level. And, and not very many people, the research shows maybe 7% of the people ever get to that level. So it's not an easy thing to do. And then I wanted to also compliment the material that is, because he doesn't give a whole lot in here, and in the words of my perfect teacher, and this section is basically stories. There's no just direct information. But one of the things the Dalai Lama uses a lot, we were talking about how difficult some of these things can be to look at somebody as more important than ourselves, but the eight verses for training the mind. So I just read those to you with a determination to accomplish the highest welfare for all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-fulfilling jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whatever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest among all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind, and as soon as an afflictive motion arises, endangering myself and others, will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish things of bad nature, and those pressed by strong sins and sufferings, as if I had found a precious treasure very difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer the victory to them. When one whom I have benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mothers, all other sentient beings. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the sins of the eight worldly conceptions by the understanding by understanding all phenomena as like illusions. Be released from the bondage of attachment. So those verses, it can look a little challenging too to be able to go that far, but if we look at it from the view of the Bodhisattva, that's the goal. I want to be able to get there. That doesn't mean that we can do it today or maybe tomorrow, but if that's the goal and we review these kinds of things, training our mind that it is possible to get that way without feeling hurt, being hurt, or hurting others, then that can be very beneficial to us as well as others as a part of that. Let's go on then. That first one was rather short, but the next one is much longer. So for the 83rd to 85th days, we are doing the practices related to giving, uh, or perfection of giving, excuse me. So here, these are related to action bodhicitta. And so from the lamp for the path to enlightenment, it says, having developed an aspiration for enlightenment, constantly enhance it through concerted effort. To remember it in this, in it, it is, oh, excuse me, to remember it in this and also in other lives, keep the precepts properly as explained. Without the vow of the engaged intention, perfect aspiration will not grow. Make effort definitely to take the vow since you want to wish for enlightenment to grow. And so then from the Buddha's office spiritual collection, it says you should practice the precept of action bodhicitta for not losing your bodhicitta in the current and next lives. So Rinpoche says we should then practice the six perfections one by one, which is the precept of action bodhicitta as much as we can. So that's where we're moving toward here. Especially for those who practice Dzogchen, you need to practice the precepts of action bodhicitta to realize the Dzogchen wisdom. Even though we can do only one prostration, offer only a single butter lamp, or write down one syllable of spiritual dharma, everything 
should be taken as the spiritual path for realization of Dzogchen and as part of the Dzogchen path. So we don't just give up on all of the rest of the path when we get to Dzogchen. It's not just about staying in a state of Rikpa. Everything else still applies to that. This is the great instruction of the Dzogchen teaching. The bodhisattva conduct is vast like an ocean, but you can include all of those in the six perfections. You can also include the two accumulations of merit and wisdom, either as separate practices or in the six perfections. So the perfection of giving, perfection of morality or ethics, perfection of patience, perfection of effort, perfection of concentration, are the accumulation of merit. So those are the first five of the six perfections. Then the perfection of wisdom is the accumulation of wisdom. So we can also include method and wisdom, and so he quotes here from the lamp for the path to enlightenment. Apart from the perfection of wisdom, all virtuous practices, such as the perfection of giving, are described as skillful means by the victorious ones. Whoever under the influence of familiarity with skillful means cultivates wisdom will quickly attain enlightenment. So very important to do all of those elements. We only call them perfections when practice. We can call each of them a perfection separately as well, like the perfection of giving, perfection of morality, and so on. As the Prajnaparamita text, the verses that summarize the perfection of wisdom says, millions or billions of blind people can never know the paths to the city and would never reach the city if they did not have a guide. It is the same that the five perfections can never become perfected without the eye of the perfect, of perfection of wisdom and therefore they would never attain achievements. So here then the perfection of giving, uh, sometimes also called generosity, and this is the first of them. And within that, there are three topics. The first one is material giving, and then we have dharma giving or teaching, and then giving protection from fear, the one that people seem to have a little bit more trouble trying to understand, although it's not particularly difficult. So we start with giving of material. That's the more obvious one. There are also three topics within that ordinary giving, great giving, and exceptional great giving. So the first one, you see very detailed explanations of these three forms of material giving in the words of my perfect teacher, and that is on page 234. 234, easy to remember. So we'll take a look at that. down towards the bottom of the page in my translation here. So material giving, the first part of this is ordinary giving, giving anything that is material. So that could include things like money or uh, giving uh, a tonka painting or giving food to somebody who needs food or other kinds of things like that. The key is pure intention that we're giving it to them to benefit them. The focus is on the other person or perhaps an organization or whatever. But the amount of the giving is not really important. What it is is you have the intention of the giving. On page 235, the last paragraph, it says, generally speaking, the Buddha taught material giving and other practices involving material possessions mainly for lay bodhisattvas. That would be us. If you're a monk or a nun, you can reduce your desires and learn to be content and accept hardships. So those are some of the things that are not necessarily the kind of things that are expected for lay practitioners, although we can also aspire to those types of things. The next one is great giving. So on page 236, uh, below the quote and in the next paragraph below that, great giving. This means to give to others something rare or very precious to you personally. 
So maybe you have something that, that you value for whatever reason. It doesn't have to be monetary value, but something that is meaningful to you. And then to let go of that and be able to give that to somebody else, it becomes a precious gift for that person as a part of that. And then the third one is the exceptionally great giving. And here again, you give a gift of your own limbs, body, or life. Now, that is exceptional. Okay, this is not something that we normally expect. There are, of course, some teachings about the Buddha who gave his body to the lioness who was desperate for food in order to uh, survive in a way that she could then feed her cubs and so forth. And there are various stories about some of these types of generosity, but they are clearly beyond what most of us are able to do, at least at this point in time. So in the middle of that paragraph, he says, however, this sort of generosity should be practiced only by a being who has attained one of the bodhisattva levels. For the moment, mentally dedicate your body, life, and wealth to the benefit of others without attachment, praying that one day you will be capable of, capable of actually giving them away. So for now, it's enough to just mentally give those things away. You don't have to actually do that. But someday maybe you'll get to that level where you could actually do that when necessary. And in many ways we actually see that uh, in many examples if you watch news. Uh, the military is a good example where somebody gives their life to protect others in their unit. Uh, that happens quite often. Uh, but you see similar kinds of things. Somebody gives their life to try and rescue somebody from a river or a car accident or something like that. Uh, people do these very kinds of things. I'm sure that they're not consciously thinking about that at the time, but those are examples of this kind of giving. And so I think that uh, rather than thinking about these as just totally extraordinary, something that only happens in stories, it really does happen, and it happens every day uh, in many different kinds of, of situations. And you don't have to be a Buddhist for that to happen either. You know, we can all do those kinds of things when called upon to do it at that level. So let's go back then to the main part of our text here. So those are the things on the first one, the giving of material. Ordinary, great giving, and exceptional great giving. Then we go on uh, here, uh, so he goes through some things in his text about these. So the first paragraph there below the one I read before, the instruction is to try and give something to others as much as you can all of the time. For example, food, clothes, or money to the poor, medicine to the sick, or give food to animals that are hungry. Shanti Davis said, at the beginning of the guide of the world encourages uh, encourages the giving of such things as food. Later, when accustomed to this, one may progressively start to give away even one's flesh. And then continues on with his comments. So, if you cannot give big things to people at the beginning, never give up your giving practice, and there is no need to upset yourself. You should try to start from beginning from giving a little things to another and slowly give in greater amounts to people with your bodhicitta mind. You should make that experience happen. One person cannot benefit all people in this world, but definitely you will have the ability to help a few people. So don't beat yourself up if you can't save everybody, all seven billion people in the world, uh, but you can help a few people and that's what's important. You look for opportunities. So uh, when you get an opportunity to practice Buddha's up doctrine, you should never lose this great opportunity. You will have great benefit from these acts of material giving. People will feel happy toward you. And in the next life, you will be born as a rich person. Now, we never know for sure how karma is going to act, but the basic idea of the, our generosity in this life will come back to us at some point in, per, in the future. Now, being a rich person doesn't necessarily mean monetary wealth. It can be other kinds of things as well. 
Then we go on to the second one here in more detail regarding the second form of generosity, giving of Dharma. There are many different kinds. For example, making a statue, a stupa, and printing Dharma texts, making Buddha images to give to people. The most supreme Dharma is giving to, is giving, <laughs> let me try that over. The most supreme Dharma giving is to give empowerments, transmissions, and Dharma instructions. For example, if you give a huge amount of wealth to a person, it is only enough to be used during this lifetime. After death, one can no longer use this wealth. But if you give Dharma teachings to that person, and if you will rescue him from being born into lower realms, this benefit would be inconceivable for that person. So giving of the Dharma can be of more value than giving of wealth per se. At this time, so many people are creating negative karma by committing different kinds of negative actions, such as uh, doing things for money, for name, and so forth. Therefore, if people do not practice dharma, it is very dangerous for them, as they may be born into lower realms in the next lives, their next lives. So you should help them purify their karma through virtuous actions by giving them dharma teachings. And perhaps the best way to do that isn't by formally giving teachings the way I and some of you do from time to time, but rather being a role model for people. Um, in Buddhism, we talk about uh, not going out and uh, trying to uh, recruit people in and, and espouse our various beliefs and those kinds of things. We don't wear the Dharma on our sleeves, but we can do it through our role model and how we go about doing things, how we go about treating people. And it makes a difference. People recognize that kind of behavior. And so that is the kind of thing that we can do here in terms of giving the Dharma. So then he goes on to say, you can also help them to arouse bodhicitta mind by giving Dharma teachings, especially if you can bring them to enlightenment within this life, the bardo state, or the next life, by giving your Dzogchen teachings. So here we are talking literally about Dharma teachings in that way. The benefits are inconceivable. No one can see the end of the benefit. Therefore, you should learn how to give Dharma instructions to benefit others. And to do this, you also should practice and accomplish experiences with those practices. Uh, we do have, although we don't uh, advertise it or promote it anymore, a teacher curriculum. Uh, available and uh, it involves independent study uh, with me and uh, so we uh, as a mentor for doing those kinds of things so if you're actually interested in being a Dharma teacher uh, then there is that curriculum that we can go through much of it involves going through that in much more detail a lot of those would be classes you've probably already had before. So for example, Nundro, but then we go through the Nundro again, so you get better depth and understanding of that in order to be able to teach that to others. It also has some classes on teaching methodology and so forth of that kind of thing. Uh, leading Dharma, how do you lead people in Dharma practices and, and all of those kinds of things as a part of it. So I just kind of toss that out there. If you're interested in that, let me know and we can discuss that with you. Rinpoche then goes on to say that at this time we have many different ways to give teachings to people like Facebook, YouTube, the internet. Um, but then he says the lineage does not allow you to give Dzogchen and other secret profound teachings to the public. But you can teach karma to help beings not commit negative deeds, about refuge, bodhicitta, and so forth. Uh, when I was at the uh, teachings with the Dalai Lama, the Kalachakra initiation that he did in January of this year, uh, 1917, wow, it's been almost a year now since we were there. Um, but one of the things that he talked about there is that this is the 21st century. And we do have all kinds of technology, and we should become 21st century Dharma teachers and take advantage of that. And he was addressing it in that context, particularly because a bunch of people from China, Tibet, 
had come to the teachings to receive the Kala Chakra empowerment and China had threatened them that they would be put into prison when they came back or if they didn't come back their families would be put into prison and so forth. And so the Dalai Lama actually met with them and told them to go home and that he would be giving the teachings and it would be broadcast and they could receive that if they had access to it they could receive that through the broadcast. If they didn't have access to that all they had to do was keep it in their heart that the teachings were going on and they would receive those teachings indirectly anyway. So I think it is something that's a little bit different the kind of the standard protocol if you will of how the teachings are given and to whom the teachings are given and so forth uh, but there are things being done to take advantage of these newer systems and we do online classes this one's being recorded so that people can take the class online for example and we have a variety of other classes we have over 500 videos now uh, that are a part of all of these classes and so uh, there's a lot that we can do to help share the Dharma in those ways um, we can also answer questions for people as a part of that. Uh, it's probably best not to be too specific and go beyond uh, what they might be able to understand as a part of that. Um, but particularly people that have at least some Buddhist background, we can go a little bit deeper in terms of how we answer questions for people. So we don't have to be proactive in trying to share things with people. We can do it as our role model and people learn that we're Buddhist and they have questions that happens to me all the time people have questions about Buddhism and, and I'm more than happy to share things with them in that way so go back to our text the commentary from Rinpoche here um, when you give Dharma teachings, you should always give people teachings that match the Buddha's words and great masters instructions. So we should always do our best to teach this as it is taught in the, the core texts. Um, sometimes we have our own opinions, we have our own beliefs about some of these things, but we want to try and stay as close as we can to the root teachings, uh, even though we may vary a little bit in our own personal outlook on that. We want to keep it as pure as we can in terms of what gets passed on. If they want to vary a little bit in their own interpretation and understanding of that, then they can do that. But we want to try and keep it as true as we can. If someone questions you about the Dharma with the intention to better understand Dharma, you should give an accurate answer with clarity. But if anyone who criticizes your teaching from different religious or lineage standpoint or belief system, you should not debate with harsh words. So if they don't like it, they want to argue, don't argue, just say, okay, and don't discuss it any further with them. Just leave them alone if they cannot accept your view. Briefly speaking, at all times and in many ways, you should try to give Dharma teachings to people who do not have the wisdom eye to distinguish the authentic spiritual path. So there are things that we can do, but we need to be a little bit careful about how far we go in terms of some of the more secret, if you will, uh, teachings. They're, they're usually described as being secret, not because we don't want to tell anybody about them, but because if they don't have an adequate background, you may misunderstand, and we don't want people to misunderstand those things either. Continuing on here from Rinpoche's commentary, another way to give Dharma teachings is from the top of the mountain or near the ocean, and so on. It has great benefit for humans and animals to hear your Dharma teachings, especially if you give Dharma teachings or recite mantras to the animals or show them a Buddha's image. Uh, notice that Buddha images are becoming quite popular. You see them even in various ads on TV quite regularly now and, and in the settings in, in various movies and TV programs and stuff you'll see Buddha statues or paintings or things like that. It's become quite popular. So I think that could be a good thing even if they don't actually completely understand that and the nature of it and so forth. 
And if they see these images, then they will be born to the human realm as Dharma practitioners through the power of Dharma blessings. We have many stories illustrating this, like Lopan Ludro Tempa's story and the story of the 500 ducks who took rebirths in heaven by hearing Dharma and so on. The third one, then, that we are talking about as a part of this particular form, which is giving, is giving protection from fear. And I mentioned that this one can be a little bit confusing on the surface for people, but it's not particularly difficult. So this means to help sentient beings who do not have protection and to rescue, rescue from, uh, rescue their lives. For example, at this time, His Holiness Chatro Sunge Dorje and my great teacher, Kinchin Tsultram Lodro, this is Rinpoche's teacher, not mine personally, are rescuing many billions of animals' lives each year. Another great Lama, who has Bodhicitta mind, does the same. If you can protect one animal, who is in fear of losing its life, that is Buddha activity. And you are also spreading Buddha's Dharma activities. At this time, we know very clearly there are so many animals losing lives with great suffering by being tortured or killed from horses, buffaloes, and yaks to little insects. They may lose their, lose their lives to satisfy human desires by being skinned for fur and money. Therefore, you should try at all times to rescue animals' lives as much as you can with compassion and bodhicitta. So, whenever we have this opportunity, and we've talked about this a little bit before, that in our particular place, physical location, it can be difficult to do some of these because they talk about, for example, buying live fish that have been, the fishermen go out and they capture these live fish. Well, in the U.S. they don't usually stay alive when they bring them in. Occasionally they do, but usually what they bring in, they have put them in freezers on the boat and so they're no longer alive. Uh, so we wouldn't be able to do that in those cases. and. Uh, with animals, there are not a lot of cases, for example, where uh, people would sell live birds that uh, normally would be taken for food and so forth. So there, there aren't a lot of examples where we could apply it in that way. But insects might be a good example. Insects that get into our house, you can capture the insect, take it, release it outside. So that would be an example of how we might apply that in our particular location here in Tucson. Uh, but just look for opportunities in all of these teachings. Look for opportunities is a key phrase. As we look for more opportunities, they will show themselves. And we will see, and as a result of that, we will actually be able to do more of these kinds of things. So this is the special characteristic of Buddhism. Please read the Buddha's life stories, which show him living, uh, giving protection from fears. Then you will know how to give sentient beings protection from fear. Uh, previously, Rinpoche here had no idea of how crabs were killed for food. And one day, while he was living in Maryland, he personally witnessed to his utter shock and disbelief some women doing it. They began by washing the crab by rubbing it with a steel brush. Because of the harsh brushing, their eyes popped out and leg legs ripped out. The crabs were then put into a boiling pot. After heating them up for some time, the crabs were then fried in a dry pan, a dry hot pan without any oil or water. As the lid of the frying pan was made of transparent glass, he could see the froth coming from their mouths. It was such a frightful sight that you would not wish to think about it, let alone see it personally. As the crabs are fried dry in the pan, he could feel their excruciating pain as they gather all their might and desperately start leaping in every direction, but alas, to no avail, as they could not lift the lid open. After witnessing that, uh, he tried, uh, we tried our best, now he's talking about his sangha, I believe, uh, we tried our best to save money every month to save and free some crabs from that hellish damnation. So if you do like this, it can be very beneficial to the animals. Our Yeshe Day's uh, Buddhist Cultural Dharma Center, that's his Dharma Center there in Maryland, has plans for additional preparation to save lives each year. So we practiced Bodhisattva conduct with Lama and students together as a group. 
by doing that. Now, one of the options then, looking for opportunities, and there are a variety of groups that do this kind of thing, would be to make a donation to a group who does this and say this is a donation to help facilitate the saving of lives. And so that's one way that we can contribute to it without having the opportunity to directly do so. So just throw that out. And so then for these three days, contemplate the perfection of giving as explained and learn them well by heart. So then we do the concluding practices the same as we did before. So that's the conclusion of that part and the conclusion of the teachings for today.